We traveled down south to Texas to tour Andy's massive Austin-based lab. Every product has prototypes and stories behind it, but those stories rarely get told. In this exclusive series, we get to tell them. We saw heat spreaders etched by lasers, cross-section CPUs, vapor chamber IHSs, and a highly technical show and tell. This is a by 16 interposer card. We call it Splinter. So this is a PCI Gen 5 okay. protocol analyzer. This is just a normal PCI, uh -huh. you know, Gen 4 by 4. This is actually a clock generator. This is one of our reference boards. Can you infinitely seven. nest these? Or like? I've done it. <laughs> okay. would, would someone productize it? No. <laughs> Can you do it? Yes. But not everything here is ultra technical. Is this, um, this is so when you put in the request for this, mm -hmm. Does Lisa personally approve it, or does she find out later? This documentary was originally going to be four separate videos, but we decided to take a massive risk and try something new. We're making one conclusive, detailed documentary about AMD's testing, thermal, and failure analysis facilities. So share this video far and wide and consider supporting us directly. This video documents AMD's BrainUp Lab, where new processors are not only tested, but sometimes concepted in true skunkworks fashion. We'll also walk through the Thermal Lab, including an interview with Sakesh, an engineer who explains the vapor chamber IHS prototypes, thinned heat spreaders, and other moonshot engineering projects that AMD has worked on. We'll then tour the Device Failure Analysis Lab, where AMD can use circuit editing machines and other advanced equipment to diagnose chips and identify solutions. And finally, we get to see an IHS get etched and branded. AMD trusted our team of highly trained professionals to have full access to their campus, so we put our best foot forward. <laughs> we got it! Let's get started. This expensive video series is brought to you by us and a special autograph promotion on store.gamersnexus.net. Some channels would charge six figures to the host company for a tour like this, but we always need to retain full editorial control and independence over this kind of content. Our documentary today is fully and only funded by our viewers' support on store.gamersnexus.net and your purchases of our PC building, anti-static mod mats, and other items like mouse mats, pads, 3D drink coaster packs, and our large silicone soldering and project mats make all of this possible. For the next seven days only, if you purchase an autographed mod mat from the dropdown on the store, it'll be more than just my signature. Vitaly and Mike from the team will also be signing alongside me. The three of us haven't signed something like this together before, but we wanted to do something special for this project. This applies to all mod mat designs on the store, including the large volt mod mat with screw tracking grids, diagrams, and high heat resistance, and the freshly restocked medium mod mat with limited PCIe die cast pin and pinout cards included. Please consider funding our next documentary by grabbing something on store.gamersnexus.net. Our first stop on the tour is the AMD BrainUp Lab. Here, dozens of people work to take early silicon from initial engineering stages all the way through to production, retail-ready units. The lab is a large area packed with computers running tests, like these racks of machines that have had their CPUs programmed down to the register level allowing simulations and analysis that could never be done on retail hardware. What this device lets us do is it lets us con connect inside the CPU and get to a bunch of debug registers. That's cool. Um, as well as it offers all these relays right here. This lab actually used to be in a different room, but that room has been morphed into something else. It should be totaling up to about 250 systems in this, this lab. AMD has to run all of these systems because even though the company can project performance during design stages of CPUs, it still needs to test the CPUs to confirm those projections. Our filming in these labs was categorized into three types. Things we absolutely cannot ever show, things we can show but only in a cheeky way so as to provide every other media outlet with a sensational article headline and a cropped image of this b-roll clip where they definitely not by accident remove our watermark, and things that can be shown. Our first lab tour today in the BrainUp Lab was hosted by Bill and Amit, two engineers specializing in IO testing and core engineering. Cameras roll on. 
I'm gonna open it up with like an yeah. intro. We're probably gonna cut it. We'll see. Right. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. yeah. So my area starts here. 16 unit racks with remote desktop capability through a Raritan, so I can access these from home or anywhere in the world. And so this is a large part of my day job. Um, do an NVMe performance evaluation, and I do the performance testing aspect of the, the work for the AVL for the folks that uh, have NVMe drives on our AVL. And so here I've got systems representing workstation, desktop, um, various mobile platforms. How much you do know. you typically have running at any given time, like actively uh, doing something, I guess? We're pretty caught up right now but we have drives come in. When we get a new NVMe drive, we have on a spreadsheet, does it go on a workstation, mm -hmm. a desktop, or both? Is it a mobile-oriented drive? Is it all around um, gaming drive or whatever it is? Right. And then I run it through the applicable systems cool. for that drive, right? A Brain Up Lab is a special type of testing environment. These labs work with unreleased hardware, so that means they can disable security features and effectively hack the chips to simulate all kinds of use cases, including accessing the registers or fusing off functionality. After the CPUs are designed and the first samples are made, they come to this lab to get tested. In addition to the SSD, USB, and I.O. testing that Bill and his team do, his testing corner is also responsible for having built Expo. Other members of AMD described Expo to us as as Bill's baby, noting that he's the one who pushed for it and spent the time to develop the profiles that contributed double-digit percentage points of uplift to AMD Ryzen performance. This is uh, basically our Expo mini farm. So this is where some of the optimization work and similar to on NVMe, how we have uh, AVL, I mean, I maintain the performance aspect of that. I do the same thing for the Expo um, modules that, that seek Expo certification. Right. So all those kits come through here. So I've got, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of different um, memory module kits. And so, yeah, between that and optimization work, uh, messing with timings and other kinds of tweaks and stuff like that we do over here. I do have these uh, gadgets. Yeah. So, you know, um, we did the Expo spec uh, mm -hmm. when we did the Raphael launch, and these are um, memory module readers and programmers. Um, so I've got one um, for our DIM, um, and I've got one for you DIM. So I can dump, you know, a module, and then I can reprogram it if it has a, a non write protected SPD. So okay. I can make Expo modules right. from scratch, basically. So for stuff like this, and there's another one uh, we'll talk about in a second, I guess, but does AMD do sort of the design and engineering for these debug and brain up type parts? Or Okay, so this is kind of a special situation. Um, these were made on contract for a company by Elmore Labs. Okay. He's not allowed to sell them in his store. We were able to get permission from the company, and I was able to legitimately um, purchase cool. the, the programmer. That's cool, yeah. yeah. So he's, we've got a couple of AMD graphics overclocking um, stations over here, um, maybe for some forward-looking features right. and stuff. After getting an overview of Bill's general work area and his day-to-day -day job that has focused largely on I.O. testing and Expo testing and configuration, we took notice of a number of custom, handmade testing tools unique to AMD, plus a lot of high-end, technically commercially available analyzers and signal integrity analyzers. Bill noted that several of the custom tools have actually been spotted in leaks before, and the rumors ended up entirely wrong about their nature. So we asked about them. This is one of our reference boards, and we'll go over it in more detail in a minute, but uh -huh. you can see um, that it, it's got the SMA connectors on here. This one's been reworked so that I disable the normal clock generation, sure. and I can plug in a clock uh, on using okay. external ref clock. You know, we have external ref clock support, and uh, some of the enthusiast grade motherboards right. uh, implement that, and so that's what we were testing here. This is actually a clock generator. Um, okay. It's not available on the market just yet. This is Elmore Lab. I actually needed some clock generators, and he was working on it. So these aren't finalized yet, so I just happened to be able to get, you know, some of the first ones that he, right. that he made. And now we get to see the really funky secret stuff. It's time to see how open AMD really is. What is this? I think is the, the first question. Okay, so... Um, 
The reference board that this sock gets into appeared in several leaks back when it was first shown, but none of those leaks were accurate. Finally, we get to learn about one of AMD's best kept testing secrets, socketable, stackable chipset I.O. boards that can be combined vertically. The, the board underneath is, is this. This is our AM5 uh, reference platform. Mm. We call it Splinter. This has been seen publicly before. We did a demo at the Flash Memory Summit. Well, I think it was the first place this got solved publicly. Mm. Um, there was a lot of speculation about, you know, that this might be for a chipset um, or something like that, and that's not the case. So here we have that same board and this is plugged in um, to an otherwise normal PCI Gen 4x4, and then we have some sideband, you know, uh, miscellaneous I.O. over here, and this configuration becomes a B650 uh, motherboard with the add-in card. So the board that this is plugged into, this motherboard, is this one? Is that? Yeah, no okay. chipset at all. The clarification on whatever rumors, um, that is not for chipsets. That's right. The chipset is here. Yes. There's a ton of I.O. or pins on here. Yeah. What is all of it for? Okay, so this is just a normal PCI, uh -huh. you know, Gen 4 by 4 uh, some miscellaneous uh, I.O. over here. Uh, we can do external power, mm -hmm. um, either through a barrel jack or a 12 volt um, okay. or off of a normal power supply. Um, and then most of the rest of the stuff is debug headers, uh, USB 2 uh, headers, right. uh, you know, 10 gig USB 3, 20 gig uh, USB, and we got SATA. Um, an Ethernet, so ba like most of the kind of stuff that you would see complementing a normal motherboard. When we design this stuff, ah. we have to cover the superset of whatever uh, a motherboard vendor might make. Yeah, we have to make sure all the USB is on there, all of the you know SATA slots, uh, you know whatever they could theoretically put on. Right. We want to put it all into one system, and that way we have one platform that we can use. What is what's going on with the? Uh Additional, so, are those PCIe slots? Sure, um, okay. so this is the PCI Gen 4 by 4 and uh. miscellaneous I.O. again. Okay. Uh. This is a B650. Um, without the chipset, this would be like an A620 kind of configuration. Right. Okay. And then you got B650, and then you uh, plug this on to here, just like that, and now we can have you, Can X670. you infinitely nest these? Or like I've done it. <laughs> okay. would, would someone productize it? No. <laughs> can you do it? Yes. Yeah. But yeah, so this is an X670E in okay. this configuration. And we actually have a chassis um, that, that mounts and holds up. everything straight. Um, so it's not so precarious because I've I've had this with a PCI analyzer before and then it, it gets pretty crazy. I've got pictures of that. This is the same exact package and chip that you'd see that's, on the on the regular motherboard. Yeah, that's really cool. This is the type of thing that I, I could see the rumor mill being like. Yeah. <laughs> what is what it? are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you you've seen um, the you know there's one of the board vendors they have a B650 board that you can convert to X670E. Yeah. And they sell a card that looks a lot like this. So when we come up with a new chipset, we don't have to replace the whole reference platform. We can plug in the, a new chipset card. Right? Does, right. So does that help? I, I would imagine it would help just because you understand the entire rest of the platform, so you're maybe minimizing variables or something, but. in cost. Okay. And cost, and, yeah. And, and like for certain testing, like, you know, I'm in core design, right? Yeah. When we're testing the core, we don't need all that IO and, and different so capabilities. They, so for us, we can make a very simple platform, no chipset, and we can scale things out uh, and do core testing that way. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, any other <laughs> stuff <laughs> over here? Um, like, the number one way to make a company nervous is to start picking things up randomly in its lab. And I'm a bit of a magnet for dead CPUs. Hundreds of chips cycling through an early validation lab means not all of them make it out alive. And Bill has a bit of a problem with collecting dead CPUs. He hasn't admitted it yet. You know, I don't um, really don't kill very many parts. Oh, I see our coasters. What's what, what's with the sad CPU? Why does it have a well, sad face? Because it's one of the rare ones that I actually uh, did kill, um, but this was just one. It's a 64 core part, so I guess there's uh, some probability right. there. <laughs> this is one of the rare parts that I actually did kill um, oh, over clocking. Okay. This is a 5950. You know, I don't um, really don't kill very many parts. This is the first AM5 part um, that I killed. I think it's a 7950. I was able to disable Core 11 and it was a happy part again. Yeah, another uh, random early um, part. It basically doesn't have very much for right. markings on it. <laughs> so the coasters so. are a graveyard for dead chips. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, 
also uh, most important coaster um, is here. So this is uh, Bill's test bench number 68. Uh, that's, that's how you got it past corporate, huh? Yeah, it wasn't a problem. 67, 68. There's 60 right here. Right. There's some more back there. Yeah, sure. To even get to the CPU killing stage, though, it has to go through an extended period of silicon design. This can be as little as 18 months or as many as several years, depending on a combination of literal physics limitations, wafer node advancements, and design challenges. Because of this extended development cycle, the BrainUp Lab runs into a chicken or the egg problem. Test the CPU with a known platform, or test a platform with a known CPU. The design phase you know, can be you know, years right before we tape out. But yeah, in parallel with that, we're actually getting ready for the silicon coming back. So when the first silicon came back, we had the splinter board ready, we had to have the BIOS ready, we had to have basically everything so that we could start checking out the parts as soon as we get them, right? Because the way we say it, the clock starts you know, time zero is right when we get the first part. Right. So we need to hit the ground running. We yeah. try and hit a year. Typically, we only have a couple designs uh -huh. in flight, right? So it's kind of pipeline. Where we get constrained here is in the lab. That makes know. sense. Yeah. So we yeah. try we try and make it so we're only bringing up like one desktop part one desktop yeah. part at a time. Doesn't always work out. Yeah. But those major platform changes are the big inflections. Yeah. Eighty yeah. four was was huge. It's partly why we stick to it for as long as yeah, we can. Yeah. I mean, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Like yeah. You, you did all the hard work, yeah. so stay on it as long as you can. Yeah. And it ends up being yeah. okay for customers too if they can upgrade. And the nature of unfinished CPUs also means that the team sometimes has to engineer clever solutions just to get them working. And these can yield design insights for future products. These are kind of historic parts. These are uh, the very first parts that uh, we got for Bring Up, and they didn't have lids on them. Um, so what we did was uh, taped them up uh, with Kapton tape, and then covered them with an indium sheet just to protect the dies, so that we could have get a bunch of parts up and running, and it was less risky to try to cool them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Part of it. So with the new socket, you have to put pressure on the socket to actuate it, right? So the sheet just kind of helps protect and spread the heat a little bit too. Let's look at the last part of Bill's lab. As with the rest of the lab, Bill first had to check if there was anything secret written on the most secure form of storage in the industry, sticky notes. These um, are, let's see, yeah, these are uh, RAM drives. <laughs> um, so these are- I like, I like the discreet, <laughs> like, can I show this? Yeah. Does I have a password written on it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> I watched that video. <laughs> And now for the really cool shit. It's time to look at the last part of Bill's lab, the most expensive part. These tools are made to intercept signals, packets, and traffic flow from PCIe and USB devices. Acting as a middleman, they allow Bill to see any signal degradation, downgen protocols and speeds, and transmission loss. Between all the tools in this corner, we're looking at millions of dollars of equipment that a man who writes 69 all over his benches is in charge of purchasing. And when you listen to him explain the tools, it's clear that he's the exact right man for the job. So this is a PCI Gen 5 okay. protocol analyzer. This is a by 16 interposer card. So I can plug this into a normal by 16 you know, desktop slot where you might have your graphics card. Um, and then I can plug um, you know, a by 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 device into the top of this. Um, and then through here, um, it connects to the uh, analyzer over here. Okay. Um, so then basically, it's a man in the middle um, I can sniff all the traffic between uh -huh. the host and the graphics card or an NVMe or whatever it might so be. So what, um, what does an undesirable result look like? Link recoveries, uh, correctable or non-correctable errors. Okay. That's one of the triage steps. We can get a PCI trace. Because these high-speed links, they're designed to have some level of errors on them. Yeah. Right. All right. You have to make sure it's acceptable. And, okay. And what are the electrical parameters that are affecting that? And all these boards, like the X670s, it used to be the kind of an eight layer board for AM4. That was the premium, mm. you know, kind of design. Because of the high speed um, signaling, we had to move to more layers. So, the, like the X670 e boards tend to be 12 layer boards instead mm. of eight. And they might have to use like lower loss PCB materials okay. that cost more money. 
or um, maybe thicker layers. As difficult as this is, this is almost the easier problem for these high-speed lanes. Okay. In that it's an industry standard protocol. They uh -huh. make this sort of analysis, and the, the link is in between different pieces of silicon. O on the chip, like on between the IOD and CCD, we have these same high-speed links. Mm. But we have, <laughs> there's almost no way to get to them. This is uh, an interposer for M.2, so I can plug in the other end that looks like a M.2 drive on the end into a board or an adapter on a board, and then I can plug in the M.2 drive into this device, um, then I can boot off of it or read it or whatever. The system, as far as the system knows, this is completely transparent. It has no idea that, that this is uh, plugged in. Okay. So I can literally boot off of a drive in here and then trace um, like the boot flow or whatever I want. Whenever it collects a trace into the buffer, um, then over USB it transfers it to cool. my host machine. I mean, Bill, what's an analyzer like that run? I mean, um, yeah. yeah, so all of this, you know, you're, it's over 500,000. Right. Easy. <laughs> for, one, for one station, right? I had, yeah, 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 yeah. over $700,000 in analyzers yeah, yeah. Um, in 2022. Yeah. yeah. So that'll keep me going for a little while. And that's the Brain Up Lab. We have a whole separate interview with these guys talking about some of the history of Ryzen, including never before told stories about how AMD bet the company on Zen. That's already on the channel and we've linked it below for you to watch after this. Now though, it's time for a short intermission as we traverse the sprawling AMD campus to explore another lab. This one is filled with hundreds of testing machines. This device testing lab is dedicated to running multiples of every new CPU in the pipeline and it's tasked with determining performance and finding bugs. The entire lab can be maintained by just a few people in slower periods, but ramps for more intensive launches. Workers are mostly tasked with swapping components and executing test requests from lab managers or engineering, including micro benchmarks to analyze the impact of changes to frequency, voltage, or other chip parameters that can be controlled prior to determining the full product default settings. All of this can be done by fusing off the silicon or accessing registers via JTAG, something that Josh explains for us. Ready? Yep. So now we're in a lab filled with hundreds of systems, and I'm joined by Josh, the lead for desktop power and performance. I, I think this part's pretty self-explanatory. So we were ballparking it. What did you think like the system count was that? Yeah, so I, I think we've got about 20 systems per rack and we've got quite a number of racks. Uh, it should be totaling up to about 250 systems in this, this lab. How far in advance is this stage? Like what you're doing right now, generally from product launch? So this is very early in the okay. engineering samples. Designs go through multiple steppings and multiple phases. And so depending on how you've kind of planned that execution, if you plan for a multiple mm. stepping kind of program or not, um, this one's very early in, in one of our steppings that we're going to do for a future product. And it's looking to get coverage before we lock the next step. Okay. This lab, what it's doing currently is it's a test bed for a superset of our product, mm. right? It's, it's got kind of the top of the line silicon that we can configure however we need to do it. Um, to test different core count configurations or different pipelines. We run a set of proprietary tests mm. that are designed and owned by AMD to really exercise every little bit of the processor and take it through so that we make sure that every data path and every kind of computation does what the design said it should do. And if it does something a little bit different that we can understand it and replicate it and duplicate right. it. This lab also had something of particular interest to me the world's biggest seven-segment display. We asked Bill what it does. This gives us the full uh, debug code. That's cool. I've got an internal website I can go and I can look up, you know, whatever the codes mean. And I can plug USB into this and go to my host laptop. Does it have a screen on it? It does, well, That's yeah. really cool, So too. I can connect to Wi-Fi um, or, or USB with that. Uh -huh. I can watch this step through. Every single code pops up with a timestamp, uh -huh. and then um, I can even break out even more detailed uh, logging information that it'll pump out, and I can watch the whole boot flow. Um, I, I was uh, primarily using it for Expo stuff because I can actually watch the memory training occur. Okay. So, like while it's happening, I can see it 
schmooing. Schmooing. Yes, schmooing. That's a technical term. These machines are often running what AMD calls micro benchmarks, which include a bunch of code snippets that are micro code based or sometimes higher levels of code. These types of tests target specific aspects of the IP and design, and then AMD can use them to iterate and cycle through test patterns to make sure every type of configuration with the CPU on the platform is at least tested. The objective? Find bugs, and then fix them early in the engineering sample stages. As for using fusing in this testing process, that's something we'll let Josh explain. So uh, in our products, we support a set of fuses mm -hmm. that kind of can convey how the system should be booted up and configured from the higher level sure. firmwares and stuff like that. So what we do here is that we have these JTAG devices that connect to them and it will it can go in and preempt the fuses that are actually in the part or if no fuses are present, um, supply some mm -hmm. to the firmware so that the firmware can boot up in, in a different configuration than it would. And that really lets us iterate through all of those different configurations. And when you say configurations, are you talking like, for example, 7600X versus 7950X? So that's that's one set of it. You can think of it at that level, but it really goes deeper. Okay. There's different um, there's different actual like IP blocks that you can fuse off or different pipelines that you can use to connect those. Mm -hmm. And so it really lets you go through all of those individually okay. and lets us find for that final product, which ones are, are good, which ones behave how we expected, and it lets us kind of, if something goes wrong with those, reconfigure it and work around it. Okay, once stuff goes through here and you collect all the data, what's the next step? Like, who looks at the data? What do they typically do with it? So uh, this this whole test infrastructure and everything is owned by our cores design team. Mm. And so that's a very big team because the cores are obviously a very big part of the product. Right, yes. Right? <laughs> There's a bunch of people on that team. So uh, depending on the type of failure that we hit here or what kind of test we did, it'll go to it'll go through triage, which is just directing it uh -huh. um, to the right team to look at it and we'll work to understand it. And um, if there was a problem, sometimes there's a problem with the actual executable that we ran mm -hmm. on it and that'll get patched and then we'll do some further okay. testing or it'll actually go back and feed into a, a new stepping of the design or something. Okay, I see. Up next, the AMD Thermal Lab. It's time to see some of the most captivating, unique secrets from the catacombs of AMD's offices. Until now, nobody outside of AMD was allowed here. This darker AMD lab is more lived in than some of the others. It has some grungy charm to it, and it's clear that a lot of work has gotten done here. The lab is packed with prototypes that will likely never be released, but that we can show. It's also packed with testing equipment, and even the floors of this lab hide secrets. Although we can't show them, all the cabling runs are easily accessible underneath the tiles here. In the dimmer lit aisles of the lab are convenient thermocouple racks with hundreds of thermocouples within arm's reach to probe temperature on devices, each hanging as if in a butcher's shop. Each row has at least one thermal chamber, some have multiple, and they're of various makes. Although AMD has customized most of these for its use cases, it also uses off-the-shelf lawn wind thermal chamber equipment that we've shown in a separate testing factory tour if you want to see how this stuff is made. This lab is responsible not only for thermally testing AMD's parts, but also for prototyping and designing their thermal solution. The famed eight-legged heat spreader came from this very lab. So did this laptop testing solution, which allows for cross-load testing specifically for challenging gaming scenarios on laptops. It's something that the Brain Up Lab required for Josh and Bill. They can shoot a message over to this guy, Sakesh, to get something designed, sent through computational fluid dynamics and simulations, and fabricated rapidly for their most urgent testing needs. So, and Vitaly, I want to be on your camera. In this lab, what do you specifically work on normally? I mean, what your role personally? So in this lab, we test all the client products, which includes from pre-silicon design 
to when we get the actual silicon, you know, we test it and make sure thermal features and the targets are achieved. Can we start with the vapor chamber? Sure. Okay. <laughs> These are from two different vendors. It's the same thickness. Okay. That that was a prerogative that mm. we had to have the same thickness as you know because of cooler compatibility. Right. This is where you know you fill in the liquid into the vapor chamber. Obviously, this is early prototype. We would have taken it off in the final sure. product. Yeah. But this is just for prototype test. What ends up being the main practical challenge? I guess with design a vapor chamber heat spreader. The practical challenge is, of course, the the power. Mm. Right, how much power you want to dissipate in this particular area. It's a form and fit as well. This packet needs to be of a specific height. That's also a big consideration. Also the flatness of it mm -hmm. is a consideration. It needs to be able to take take the heat sink loading. You know, we have different coolers, right? right? The liquid. You mean just structurally, like structurally. not collapsing? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So this is a 170 watt product, mm -hmm. right? So it needs to be able to cool that without drying out. This one was much further along. There's no fill tube on this. We kept the legs, but we went a little bit bigger because we wanted more vapor space okay. because it you know, gives you more cooling capability. Right. How close was this to becoming a reality? We were all the way through. We had all the testing, the laboratory testing and everything that we had done. So we were all the way through and we did see some benefits as mm -hmm. well. But again, there was a trade-off between, you know, cost. Most of that laboratory testing is done right here in Sakesh's thermal lab. Aside from testing in actual computers, special tools for running these tests include force applicators that assert a known amount of pressure to the CPU cooler, like an AIO. This is used to help keep testing patterns consistent and also improve efficiency by removing hardware requirements. The team can also deploy its thermal chambers to maintain consistent conditions decoupled from the lab ambient, like particularly high or low simulated ambient temperatures. And since it didn't make it to the product, you can guess what their determination was. Yeah, is 3C enough? Probably not. You know, it doesn't justify the cost. Yeah, you're in yeah. territory too where someone could spend an extra five, ten bucks on their cooler and get similar or more benefit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Depending on what they're buying. Unfortunately, not every idea is feasible for a product. But there is good news, and it's that this gives us a lot of really cool material to look at. This is a cross section of this, uh -huh. right? You cut it horizontally, and you can see the the posts here, and then there is the wick structure within the post. Yeah, right? that's In really cool. In between the posts, um, of course, you need the posts to be able to take the mechanical load, mm. and also it brings the fluid back from the condenser, which is the top of the lid. Okay, yeah. Right. That's so that's why the, where the cooling happens, so the water evaporates from the bottom. But they also have um, a wicking, a porous structure around it. Okay. Because it needs to pull the water down. So what are, what are we looking at here? You uh, see the solid copper yeah. regions? Those are the posts. Okay. Where you don't see any copper, that's the vapor space. It's, it's not like it's completely filled mm. with liquid because it so needs be no some room for it to, to evaporate. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you, earlier when we were talking, did you say you guys worked on this idea for a couple of years? Is that right? Uh, like on and off? Or? I want to say we started it even before the pandemic. I want to say at least three years. So was that Zen 3 era or was that in preparation for Zen 4 already? It was in preparation for Zen 4. Okay. Yeah. 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 I always forget, I mean, in the public, we <laughs> see this stuff like way way after you guys do. Obviously. Yeah, we so, evaluate a lot of this. Right. right. What, what can you share about thinning the IHS. The reason we wanted to do this was to see if we get any benefit from thinning the lid. We did run some pre-silicon models, you know, when we didn't have the actual you know, product in our hand. And what our simulations pretty much showed was that, um, you know, you see maybe a degree benefit okay. as you, but then there's a minima and after which it starts to increase because uh, you don't have as much copper to spread yeah, so the heat. Not just diminishing returns, but actually getting worse. If you go too far, yeah. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, so that's why you know we looked at this particular par. You know, we said, is it worth it to give up? It was a trade-off. Right. Is it, was it worth it to give up uh, cooler compatibility for a thinner lead? This is crazy thin. I mean, my takeaway here is that the the biggest reason not to pursue this is you instantly force everyone to buy a new cooler. 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so. very minimal benefit. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. As we walked around the lab and talked more with Sakesh, we came to the topic of CFD simulations for these types of projects. The team told us that CFD simulations are able to very precisely model the impact of experiments like lid thinning prior to ever making a sample, which helps guide the team down the right path and avoid wasting time on poor designs. But even still, there's no substitute for physical testing of ideas. The team has racks upon racks of debug tools that can be remotely accessed from any of AMD's campuses, making it easy for teams to remotely manage and inspect test beds. This is accompanied with some heavy duty networking racks and patch panels that make that access happen. Elsewhere in the lab, chillers are available for additional testing, including high power tests to evaluate CPU scalability under extreme heat conditions while still being actively chilled. A more unique custom to AMD testing tool is this lid with a thermocouple embedded in it. We do case temperature measurements. So case is temperature at the top of the lid here. We do it to, to um, understand like thermal solution capability. Mm. And it's a, we call it the case to ambient thermal resistance. And that's what this thermocouple is measuring. Um, the way we do it is we have a very small groove that we mill in here. And we attach a type T thermocouple um, that goes all the way, the bead goes all the way to the center here. And then we put thermal epoxy on top of it and we completely flatten it down so that there's no ridges or anything which might affect engagement of the cold plate on the lid. So for this last piece, direct eye frame, yeah. these have been in the news on and off for years. I, I don't know if you've ever seen any of their Bowers stuff he's done with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, seen, we've seen the Bowers videos. So this, we wanted to deal it the part mm. and we wanted to see do we get any thermal benefit meaningful thermal benefit or not and this is our ryzen 7950x part that mm. we delayed it and we designed this frame internally we tested this with liquid metal and one of our um we have our one of our coolers here so you hooked it up to basically an x70 or 63 or something or x62 yeah kraken x60 Three, right, and yeah, we were we were testing to see what kind of thermal benefit we got. We saw it on six six C thermal benefit mm -hmm. and a sixty megahertz you know, on running an all core workload. Sixteen or sixty? Six zero. Sixty. Okay, megahertz. that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. that was. I mean, yeah, liquid metal. We obviously use liquid metal. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Is there a, a use case that AMD would first we, party want to pursue, or we're still evaluating it? Okay. Because I mean, we do see some benefit. Right, but there's also um, you know some trade-off that we need to think of. Right, um, you know, exposing the lid like that, uh, the dyes, you know, and also using liquid metal. It's going you know. back like 30 years ago, right, when the CPUs would ship with no lid, and, and they, they just have like the foam bumper on it. Yeah, and yeah. people would crack the dye if they did too much uh, torque on too the cooler. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. but but. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of um, benefit, right? Yeah, <laughs> and to be fair, that was before people were playing around with like a frame, like those older CPUs. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we may be able to protect it better these days. So, so still researching direct. Still stuff. researching. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. Up next, we visit an even more advanced lab to learn about how AMD does device failure analysis. We recently used an external lab with similar tools to what AMD has here when we researched the failing X3D CPUs with submersive acoustic scanning and cross-sectioning. But AMD's lab goes many steps further. It has circuit editing machines that can literally reroute the CPU circuitry, although they have to keep some tools secret from their competition. For the tools that I can't show you. Mm. This lab is helmed by Jason. He speaks of such engineering marvels that we weren't even sure if he was joking half of the time. We have to run tests on them while we're looking through the silicon, shining lasers or collecting right. photons or whatever we're doing. <laughs> okay. um, I, I don't know if that's actually a thing you do or not at this point. It sounds like it's a thing you do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, it is a thing. But you I can, can also say things like collecting here. photons. I'm like, sure. And you're like, I'm actually just joking. We don't do no. that. <laughs> the lab features tools for cross-sectioning down all the way through the silicon 
one layer at a time so that the team can perform reliability testing or part post-mortems. They also have these special boards, basically a CPU for giants. These are, we call them breakout boards. Okay. All it is is a socket and then every pin wow, wired out. Wow, that's for, cool. And then all the power supplies wired Dang. out. And while in the lab, we learned about all kinds of depth gauges, profilimeters, sanding and grinding machines, and even tools that AMD hasn't brought fully operational yet. Jason was so technically minded and quick that we stopped the off-camera note-taking and asked him to just jump straight on camera with us and walk through the lab. So the video begins in the middle of a technical discussion about how AMD can use ovens to research and repair certain types of failures. How's your light in here? Pretty good. Cool. There's a phenomenon called BTI, um, mm. bias temperature inversion. Okay. And when you stress a part at high temperatures and high voltages, and you don't really toggle a lot of activity through it, mm. uh, you can get trap charges and stuff that can cause the part to fail when okay. you try to test it again. But you can redistribute the charge if you can bake it, you know, okay. for a while you can redistribute the charge and recover. And so we consider those types of fails, they're not real fails, mm. you know, they're induced by our, our testing. I see. So we can use this to kind of recover from that and say it's not a real fail. Interesting, okay. Jason's lab ends up dealing with not only internal failures, and he has Bill to thank for job security. You know, I don't um, really don't kill very many parts. But also external reliability. Any CPUs that fail for unexpected reasons in the wild could be candidates to be sent here to get analyzed non-destructively first and then destructively. But it's the destructive aspect that interests us most. I just noticed these. I set those out. These yeah. look amazing. This is this will be a really good shot. What's going on here? They basically drilled through the lid with these tools. You can grind it away. Well, so we basically find the X, Y. Oh. And then we'll send it to our physical failure analysis team, our PFA team. And then they do all the cross sections okay. and the, the real pretty pictures that you see right. that show the actual defect. We like to say 20 billion transistors on the chip and we have to find which ones were bad. So that was a hand polisher. It's just a right. wheel that spins and you have to hold the device on it to, to polish it. So over here, these are polishing wheels. Mm. They're a little more automated. They have a puck on the end and you can, uh, we attach the device to the puck uh, okay. with some wax and then they'll put some uh, polishing pad down here or a grinding pad, depending on how much they're trying to remove. And then this will come down, the wheel will spin around and it's putting out a continuous stream of water to keep That's everything. Cool. These are basically like CNC milling tools. They have bits. You can do anything from grinding. Like uh -huh. this, it's, a, it's basically covered in diamond right. things. You can grind to remove a lot of silicon. So this has like a polishing pad on the end. Mm. And so then you can do like a shiny polish. So most of the stuff we need, we need to see through the silicon. So we usually like it really shiny, polished very well. So after we thin it, we still have to polish it nice and shiny. Yeah, I guess basically you're taking the problem of if you have a, a curvature on the die and you put it here, it's agnostic to whatever's being sanded, it just sands the whole thing right. at the same pace. So this is point-based, I guess. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, and so here's, do you then... here's an example. Okay. So this they've measured this one. So it takes measurements all across. That's cool. And so it okay. will follow the contour then of the die. So are these numbers like microns or something? Those, or? I believe, were microns, yeah. Yeah. For that. I will tell you that part didn't work out very well. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it works for our example. Sure. Um, you, know, you have to take the part out, measure it, but then it can suck the, that data in and then it knows what it's supposed to do. I have some thin an example over here. Yeah, let's check it out. So I've got two identical units here. That's a full thickness part. Okay. And this one's been thinned to 50 micron. This tool here measures the thickness. And so there's the number right there. So 53 micron, just wherever I'm aiming on that die. So it's 450. 450. So down, on some of the mobile parts. Down to about 53 or something. Yeah, some of the mobile parts, they grind them from 700 down Man. to. As cool as destructive testing is, the more advanced equipment is for non-destructive inspection. 
Let's move back over to that side of the lab. How about over here? So this, this, I, some of this I recognize. Yeah, so this is our laser profiler. When the dye are attached to the substrate, when they're assembled, and then, you know, all the temperatures cool and everything, there's usually some forces on the, you know, on the package that bow the package and the dye mm. is a little bit uh, flexible, so it will bow with it. So this can measure that uh, profile of that. Our high point is the white in the center, and it's at close to 70, I guess, micron. And the low points are in the very corners where that's its kind of reference zero. So this, we call it TDR. It's mm. a time domain reflectance. And what it's used for is to help debug assembly issues. Yeah, this is a substrate with nothing attached. And then this is the fully assembled product here. So what we do is we look at a, a golden curve basically from a known good unit. And then we send a signal in on one of these pins or balls and then get the reflected signal back from it. And then we look and see if it deviates from that golden curve. It's green on here, but if we deviate from it at different points, it tells the analyst that, uh, oh, we have a problem in the substrate or it could be in the die mm. or even the, the bump interface between the die and the substrate. Okay. And so they can kind of isolate, you know, without doing any kind of destructive uh, analysis. But what this is used for is the one thing we don't know when we send a signal in on a fully uh, populated uh, package, we don't know what the, where the package boundary, what that looks like. Okay. So we use a bare die to see what the package boundary looks like. And then we know at what point on this curve is the, basically the package uh, limit. It'll help narrow it down from package, die, or okay. interface. One of the challenges of analysis on a defective part is finding the fault without disturbing the evidence of that fault. When the team has time on their side, they'll employ all of these more advanced imaging techniques prior to beginning destructive, but careful dissection of the CPU. In the case of CPUs, one possible point of failure is in the indium soldering process itself, where the integrated heat spreader is secured to the CPU die. AMD can use a scanning acoustic microscope to image the indium without disturbing it. So this is our SAM. It's a scanning acoustical, uh, scanning acoustic microscope. Okay. Um, it's basically using sonar. So this tray is filled with water. You can see the water line here. And then you put your part would go in. We have these different holders to hold them in place. Mm. They go in and uh, uh, they'll be completely submerged. And then this, you bring this transducer down to right above the silicon level. Okay. And then it'll quickly raster back and forth and produce an image over there. Now what it, it can do then is if you don't if you don't have a lid on your part, uh, you can focus, kind of focus those waves and look at different kind of depths within the, the chip. So okay. it's another non-destructive way of say, looking at C4 bombs or, mm. uh, you know, we can see if there's any delamination because sometimes when things go bad, you can have Peels layers away. in your chip peel apart, and so it's good at finding delamination. What we have here, and I don't know if you can tell what that is by the uh, indium. Uh, it looks like a, like an Epic or Threadripper type part. First generation Epic, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Instead of taking the lid off, we can look at the indium, uh, what it looks like before mm. we disturb it. Uh, so this is an indium scan through the lid. Okay. And then you can see, you know, if there's any voids or what size they are. There's a spec for the voids, how many there are and how big they are. You know, if we get a part, especially if it's returned from a customer or mm. a reliability fail or something like that, where we really want to find out the root cause, we might send it to here first, just so we don't miss this and make sure, you know, it wasn't an indium issue or... Before you start digging Before we start taking it apart yeah, and, okay. and we miss it. That yeah. makes sense. So the scanning acoustic microscope allows AMD to see the voids within the solder, and although some voids are permitted, there shouldn't be too many. We next saw something that AMD wasn't really ready to talk about yet. So this, you said, still being set up. Yeah, that's our 3D, that'll be the 3D x-ray uh, when, it's, when it's installed. That'll be exciting to have here, I feel like opens up a lot of possibilities. And then we bounce back over to the breakout boards, which AMD can use to probe individual pins and pads on CPUs so that they don't have to work with such a tiny surface. So like when we're curve tracing on that guy, mm. it's easy to just put the part in here and then connect to the pin Man, you want. That's super cool. Yeah, 
Instead of having to screw around with the tiny version of the pins on the oh, CPU, yeah, yeah, yeah. assuming you can even get to them. Yeah, so we have these built for all of our products. Um, so are these, do these two particular ones we're holding map to any, to a, a uh, product? product that you know the name of? Uh, let's see, this is Navi 21. Oh so yeah, Navi 24 over here. So what's Navi 21? Uh, I don't remember. I don't either. I, I know think, I know the code names. I, think, uh, I can't. Do you remember? Was it 5700? 5700. Okay. Right. Yeah. So they have different clamps. I don't. This one doesn't have the clamp on it. Mm. This one has a, a clamp. It reminds me of kind of like those delitting tools. It does look like one. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll pop out if you unscrew it enough. But then the screw kind of clamps it. Pulls okay. It all down. And again, you see it's open, so we can see the the yeah, die. Yeah. That's super cool. Jason showed us a few more tools from his lab, but we'll save the rest of this tour for a future uncut version of these interviews. For now, let's move to the last lab. Up next, we were whisked away to one last hidden room. AMD actually etches some of its CPUs on site, and we're at the last stop now. But before we show that final machine, we want to thank you all again for sticking with us through this special video. This took weeks of editing and long hours, and we need your support to film and produce more content like this. If you like what you've seen so far, remember to go to store.gamersaccess.net and grab one of our 3D coaster packs, including four unique coasters with each one, as well as a motherboard socket coaster with a debug display, a mouse mat in blue and black or red and black colors, or one of our PC building anti-static mod mats. The autographed ones are signed by the whole team that worked on this project. Just click the drop down. This special laser etching machine has fed Epic and Threadripper CPUs today on trays to get their branding on the heat spreaders. Once loaded, it operates fully autonomously based on a map file showing the etching pattern and it doesn't require operator intervention until it's exhausted its tray count. The machine can take 10 Threadripper trays at a time, a highly specific metric that seemed to be right at the front of the mind for the technicians. Guess we'll never know why. It could also take 20 smaller CPUs, it depends on the weight. The team then loads a file for the product, initializes the laser, and checks that it's prepared. The machine requires a chiller to be constantly running during this process, maintaining 21 degrees Celsius for the machine temperature. To actually perform the etching, its voltage is adjusted based on the thickness of the IHS. Hidden underneath, three different computers are tucked away to manage the handler, the laser itself, and the vision system that optically inspects and aligns the laser against the IHS. It's time to start firing the lasers. Once the team initializes the machine, it pulls in the first tray. The conveyor belt starts moving. We can't see the actual laser moving around on the IHS that's blocked from sight so we don't go blind, but we can see the green light flickering around within the chamber. This machine has two lasers, although when they're also etching a serial number, it only uses one as it needs to keep count. When it's etching CPUs to get killed in Bill's lab a few hours later though, they don't bother with the serial number because death is near anyway. For a whole tray, the speed is shocking. It takes less than a minute to blast through all of these Threadripper and Epic CPUs, and then out the other end, a CPU is born. The AMD campuses are massive and sprawling, and this was just a few labs within the maze of buildings at AMD Austin. The tour was phenomenal to go on, and no matter what we think of one product or the next, we can all still learn from the engineers behind the hardware. We got to see the inside of silicon in ways we've never seen before. 
we learned about thermal engineering projects that AMD's managed to keep secret, and we got to see the personality of a team passionate about building components. Yeah, it wasn't a problem. 67, 68. There's 60 right here. Right. There's some more back there. Yeah, sure. It's our mission to bring you more content like this in addition to our normal in-depth review. And we've even updated our factory tour playlist to make it our official documentary playlist. So you can already get more content exactly like this. But this special style of content takes weeks to edit and we pay for all of our own travel, so we need your help to make the next big movie possible. If you liked our first big attempt at a full-length documentary, please support us directly. Head over to store.gamersnexus.net and grab one of our mod mats. We just signed a bunch more for the autographed model. And for the next week only, if you buy a mod mat with the autographed drop-down, medium and large included, it'll contain not only my signature, but the signatures of Vitaly and Mike on our camera crew, because we all worked tirelessly on this project. The three of us haven't ever signed a product like this together before, and it's a special way to commemorate our time together bringing you this content. So head over to store.gamersnexus.net now and grab a signed mod mat. The large volt mod mat is already low on stock, and we won't have a restock for a few months, so the timing's good. The mod mats are large, anti-static conductive PC building surfaces for your projects, and they contain grids for screw tracking and anti-static grounding that's been validated by third-party testers. You can also get one of our 3D coaster packs with PC components on it, one of which has a CPU socket and motherboard style layout. We're hyped to bring our next documentary to you, and in fact, we already have a tour lined up with Intel, and we're working on an NVIDIA one. That'll cover part of all of the big three manufacturers, but for each one, we're only seeing some of the operation. Subscribe to catch those next, and from our cinematography team, our sincere thanks for your support and for making it this far through the video. Let us know how we did below, and we'll see you all next time.